Hi, and thank you. Uh, my name is Hovi Getyamezian. Uh, I head the innovation service for UNHCR. Very pleased to be with you uh, today. Uh, I am also supposed to be the timekeeper, but I have a backup timekeeper that told, told me already that we're late. And so I have to rush through this. So wanted to welcome everyone. I guess I was picked for this role also because we at the Innovation Service are exploring the topic of digitizing access, uh, looking at the opportunities and the risks, uh, making sure that the communities we serve are included and they're at the center of the process of digitizing uh, that many organizations are going through. So very excited to be with you today. It's gonna be fun. As was said earlier, we have some questions for you. We want your feedback and participation. Uh, a really cool bunch of uh, presenters. We do have some colleagues uh, who are in Ukraine who might uh, have some difficulties given the current situation there. So we uh, need to be mindful if there are any uh, issues that arise. Um, and uh, without further delay, I want to give the floor now to the famous DJ and, uh, and our opener for the ceremony, Mr. Sam Chong, over to you. Thank you, my dear friend, uh, Hovig. Uh, and very delighted uh, on behalf of the Global Protection Cluster and all of our areas of responsibility uh, to open today's session with some framing remarks on uh, digitizing access opportunities and risks. And uh, once again, very, very fortunate also to have um, with us a very exciting panel discussion with colleagues from ICRC, uh, IRC, and noted partners of the Ukraine Protection Cluster and want to give a shout out to Rokata and Right to Protection. And of course, of course, very ably moderated by our innovation service, Hobix. Thank you very much also for making the time and participating in this day four of the Global Protection Forum. Um, we're looking forward in this session to exploring some of the tools, approaches, and considerations to protection in the digital sphere. Uh, in my remarks at the opening ceremony of this Global Protection Forum, we dove into some of the reasons behind we picked this as the theme uh, for this year, which is on access that protects. Um, we discussed how, we can, how can we change the narrative on access so that access is not only about getting trucks into geographic areas of coverage, but also about opening the space uh, for conflict and crisis affected communities to be protected from human rights violations, from violations of humanitarian law, and to access much needed protection services and responses. And in changing this narrative on uh, access, we must also consider and apply this in the sphere of the digital domain in terms of protection and what it means in the digital sphere. Increasingly humanitarian agencies, whether UN, NGOs, local partners, civil society. We are developing di digital tools and remote services for conflict affected and displaced communities who we cannot meet face to face. And this obviously became much more real during the global pandemic. So we look forward in this session to learning more from our distinguished panel about their work, about the positive impact that digital tools provide in crisis and humanitarian emergencies around the world. And I think we've made great strides as a humanitarian community in, for example, communication with communities and affected populations, whether it be through digital applications, humanitarian platforms, social media tools, messaging applications, all of which enhance information sharing and access to protection services by crisis affected communities. At the same time, we're looking forward to learning from and considering some of the risks and challenges in this type of work, which differ from those in traditional face-to-face -face humanitarian programming. And I hope we can think hard about how to maximize these for protection outcomes, both in terms of risks in the design of the platforms, but also in being ambitious in addressing protection threats and risks. Part of this understanding and being aware of the nature of protection risks and threats that occur in the digital sphere, whether they be causes and drivers or modalities that threaten or even modalities that can influence duty bearers and authorities. 
this is a new horizon in terms of how we look at access, how we as the protection community uh, can best respond to these threats and risks through the digital sphere. Across the protection cluster and in the protection community, we need awareness of, we need familiarity and confidence in the opportunities, but also the risks posed by the digital sphere. So what does that mean for the session today? Well, in addition to highlighting the impact of digital tools and technologies as a means of community engagement and access to or enabling access to protection services, increasing our awareness of the considerations and safeguards required around programming in this domain, I'd also like to challenge us to think what it means for access that protects couple of questions for consideration throughout the session today. How can the digital sphere help us rethink what it means to have access that protects? Do these means and these modalities of information and outreach, do they mean that trucks delivering aid are no longer the driving narrative? How far can we use the digital sphere to provide not only information, but real protective services or concrete protection interventions that mitigate or even remedy protection threats and its, their impacts? How can the digital sphere reshape, for example, protection monitoring and advocacy? Can it safely get us where we were previously unable to reach? Can it safely connect us with those most at risk of violations of international humanitarian or human rights law? Can it help us bring the story on the ground to the world so that we can make impacts on the protection domain? How can we use digital tools to bring protection by presence? And in this, we're talking about presence in the digital domain. Are there protection threats, risks, and effects that are best handled digitally? And finally, can we use digital tools for humanitarian negotiation and diplomacy? Are duty bearers, authorities, and others in the digital sphere, are, are there others we can think of in terms of the major stakeholders in this? Can we influence their behavior toward a better protection outcome through these digital tools? So in all our learning, first of all, I, I want to give my tremendous thanks that for, first of all, for those who are uh, here to share your experiences, but also, and as importantly, all those that are participating from around the world and in, in this global protection forum. I challenge us all to, first of all, to be open to learn from one another, but also to look toward the horizon in terms of the opportunities, as well as the risks uh, in the digital domain. But most importantly, how can we apply this? How can we use this to actually to reach and fulfill our ambitions for better protection outcomes? So with those opening remarks, Hovi, I hand back to you. Sam, thank you very much. A number of very important questions that will inspire us through the day, through the next few hours. Uh, I took note of some and I hope that we will find answers to your questions in the, in the session. Uh, without a further delay, I want to now give the floor to our first presenter from ICRC, our colleague Romain. Uh, Romain, you have 10 minutes. Uh, you will have to speak slowly because we do have live interpretation. And after the 10 minutes, we will have some questions for you. So without further delay, Romain, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just trying to find, okay, thanks. I got my presentation. So, um, so I try to speak as slowly as I can. So uh, basically, I'm working for the ICRC. I've been working for the ICRC for the past 30 years, so it's quite a long time. I'm quite an old timer within ICRC, so I'm not a digital native, as you can see, definitely not. So really, my background was really on protections and working as coordinator of protections, visits to detainees, security detainees, uh, prisoners of war in Middle East and different countries, like Israel and occupied territories, also in former Yugoslavia, before embracing, uh, I would say, digital uh, digital transformation that ICRC needs. So we are really, ICRC really a uh, face-to-face, I would say, organization working on the ground. And um, protecting, trying to protect as much as we can, I mean, affected communities. 
but also providing specific services. So what we try to what we're trying to do now is to build a new digital United platform. And I will speak about the why, the what, and the security challenge is related to what we call Red Safe Digital United Platform of the ICRC I'm responsible of, which is really in a pilot phase right now. So um, uh, maybe speaking about the why, um, we saw that people are increasingly connected in the field. We saw that figures in some refugee resettlement in Africa close to nearly close to 90% of people have access to a phone. And this is quite an old uh, data that we have. At the same time, there are also a new commercial actors appearing in United Spaces and providing uh, uh, also services, digital services. We saw the Google Person Finder following, I mean, high CS Craig, but also in other, you know, in other contexts. And at the same time, we saw, for example, Facebook, Launching is a Facebook safety uh, safety uh, uh, space where people can inform, I would say, friends uh, if they are alive following natural disasters and other organizations like Refugee United. With these new actors, I mean, brings opportunities, but at the same time, risk, I mean, for the people, because we know that the data that people are going to provide using these new services can be a, can be a search for and people can be tracked and this this data can be used for other purposes and humanitarian ones uh, so uh, when icrc try to see what kind of responses it has to make to digital transformation what does it mean digital transformation and providing digital services one key value for the organization was really to work as a trusted manager of sensitive information in what is really ICRC mandate. So conflict related and also other situation of violence, including migrations. So really working on digital proximity and trust as much as we can, and also having product with a high standards of data protection and data, data security at the same time. So that was the basis, I would say the baseline for a project. So when I speak about RedSafe, which is a new digital human platform, which is right now in a pilot uh, phase, is really what we're trying to achieve to build is really a platform for people affected by conflict and other human crises, so very ambitious in terms of, um, in terms of means and scope, providing safe and secure services to the people in need which is managed by ICRC, and this is important, it's open to partners, it's open to other organizations, humanitarian organizations. So the idea is really to have this platform to explore new services. For example, and I will come into more details, we built a digital vault for people to save documents or to save their contacts, but also exploring new ways to deliver services. For example, information as aid, people can find information where to get the right uh, assistance, for example, where to get, you know, shelters, where to get, you know, protections, which is not new, but it's a new way to reach people through that kind of platform and also becoming more accessible. The idea would be for that platform to be that one-stop digital shop where people need to access to ICRC services or, or partners' services. So uh, basically, it has a form of an app which is available on Android and iOS, but also a website in, in case people do not have, I mean, the, the phone with them, they could get access to a, uh, uh, through a computer. Uh, basically, these are the services that we have produced right now. The first one is quite simple, is information as it is called articles. It's articles about what are the United services you can access to in a certain context. Uh, for example, you would find, I mean, uh, basic uh, articles about what to find shelters, where to get legal advice, where to get health services in the countries. So this is an article that you can download uh, of organizations which have been vetted by the ICRC, which are providing trusted and reliable services. We can send alerts. You know, you will get all alerts you need to, to have that are pushed by the ICRC. It could be about natural disaster, but it could be also about the new services you get access to. And the third type of information, which could be very useful for people looking for services, is a map of services. You get your geolocations. It's like a Google map, 
but it's not using Google services to avoid tracking of people. So all these data are hosted internally, are built within, I would say, ICRC servers. Other type of services are with a digital vault. So we built a digital vault hosted on ICRC servers where people could save any document they need. It could be the ID, it could be a property rights, it could be a medical certificate that they need to have. It's simple, it's a simple uh, I would say, pictures and they get it uh, saved on the digital vault. They can retrieve wherever they, they want. They can have it access in offline mode, and they can also save the contacts. They can decide which contacts are important and they want to save in RedSafe, the same application. The last uh, services we are developing that is not available right now, but that will be available by the end of, um, of this year, will be messages, very simple messages. In fact, it's pre-formatted text. It's more sharing a status about where you are. But you can share your geolocation, you can share your contacts, and you can share a status like I'm safe, I'm rested, I'm still traveling. This was focus of migrant. This is the reason why we put on still traveling. Or I need assistance with the geolocation, a selfie of yourself and the contact. And you can share with another user of RedSafe. So uh, what are the benefits of doing that platform? It's a new, I would say, remote way to reach individuals and meet their needs. It's based on interviews we have been doing in a variety of contexts of people affected. We are focusing first on migrants and refugees or displaced people. And it's also a driver for innovations. And the new way also to engage with partners through a platform model, because we give them a space to publish, I would say, the services. And at the same time, it's really a secure field, a secure uh, testing ground to test assumptions we might have about new services. For example, would people use the vault to protect the document? Would they trust ICRC? And it's a driver for digital transformation at the same time. So how humanitarian partners can be involved? Uh, again, what we provide on our side is RedSafe as a new channel of information as aid and map of services to promote trusted humanitarian services. And what you can provide as a trusted partners, promotion of RedSafe, maybe supporting people to create an account and use RedSafe, or providing free connectivity, which is very important for people who don't have the means to connect to RedSafe and also use other services. So. Uh, Basically, uh, if I speak about the first pilot we had, it was launched in uh, eight countries of Southern Africa in May 2021. It was mainly focused on migrants and refugees crossing Zimbabwe. They, can co they could come from other countries in Africa and going to South Africa. Whereas we have many more users than expecting, close to uh, 19,000 after 17 months, and more than 28 organizations were accepted to be publish the services in RedSafe. So that was considered as a successful pilot. Promotion, we use different means. It could be posters, digital marketing, ads on Google and Facebook, because we are really dependent still on these means. I mean, people need to find the services. And for that, you need to, to, you need to, um, to publicize them. Having also uh, events organized and and also trying to convince also community leaders having the input on the services for them to promote also Red Safe and to get also uh, and to get the feedback on what needs to be improved. So what's planned for three them minutes? Three 20, minutes. Twenty twenty three. I'm still on time. Thanks. So uh, the idea will be to, to start building a secure two-way channel communication between affected population and ICRC delegation. What I've been presenting is message between users and not messages to, I would say, humanitarian organizations. And two pilots we want to launch for 2023. One in Central America, Mexico, and the US will be again for migrants, focusing on migrant, refugees, and IDPs. But a new one, which is quite interesting because it's a very different context in Philippines, in Mindanao, for people affected by the armed conflicts in Mindanao. So uh, one of the challenge is really how to protect data and limit the risk of people using digital services. Because what we are 
aiming at is a deployment in context affected by violence and armed conflict in line with our mandate. So we have to be seen as independent, neutral, and purely humanitarian tool. This is quite important. And we need to protect the user's data, but also to present misuse of the tool to be trusted by the authorities and different governments and the armed groups as well. So this is a challenge. And uh, so uh, the challenge comes with some decisions. So we publish only humanitarian services. It's the dilemma about which humanitarian services to publish, which humanitarian services, which organization to vote or not. And it has to be privacy and security by design. But privacy and security by design is basically you need to make risk assessment for each new phase of development. So data protection impact assessment, which is about the privacy. Security risk assessment, which is more technical security of the tool and the legal risk assessment in order to prevent, for example, legal risk of law enforcement agency getting access to the data of people you need to protect. So there are also specific field and legal risk assessment before a new deployment. And you have also to prioritize, again, to a certain extent, because sky is not a limit, security and privacy in the decision they're going to take. Finally, if I want to be more concrete about the measures that we needed to take in order to protect the data and limit the risk, information has to be verified by ICRC and by partners before publishing because you don't want, we want to, that people have access only to trusted and reliable information about the services they need. Content would be monitored by the ICRC, at least to a certain extent of the messages that they send. And the messages are restricted to preformatted text, such I'm face, I'm safe, because we want really to avoid people using a free content and having a misuse of the app. All the data are stored on ICRC servers in Geneva, so it's not, we are not using any commercial cloud, including for the data related to the maps, in fact, to benefit from ICRC legal protection, but also for the personal data to be accessible only by ICRC staff is quite important. Uh, it means that you need a lot of also funds, I mean, to build secure foundations, I mean, within the organizations and having a step-by-step -step approach, you know, starting with pilots, being careful of where you start, you know, the pilot with doing assessments, uh, seeing what works, what works less and well, and doing improvement before really making the decision to scale up. And having also communication materials to promote really cyber hygiene, the best practices. So this is basically uh, where we stand right now. And uh, if you want to know more, we have a site where you can get access to. It's only available in, in Switzerland because we have the headquarters here in Southern Africa where we have the pilot. And I also recommend to have a look at the handbook on data protection, you made an action when you have a lot of information about responsible use of technologies for you made an organization. Thank you. Thank you, Romain. Thank you. Very exciting. I am, uh, um, I, I am inclined to ask you a ton of questions, but today I'm a facilitator, so I can't do that. You have prepared some questions for our audience. So we want our audience now to you have a minute per question that is being asked. So we're going to now see the first question on the screen. We want you to click on the link. And so we want you to give uh, concrete examples uh, of the dilemma where you have to make hard decisions and find the right balance between security constraints. We have multiple choice, so you can pick and we want you to click on the link and that is available in the chat and start answering. And you have a minute to do so. And I can see already some people are answering. Don't be influenced by the answers that are coming in. Pick your own, use your free minds to do so. Uh, you have now 45 seconds left and we still have only a few of you and we have over 200 participants, so I'm expecting a spike. Look at that, people are answering the questions. Fantastic. So we've gotten some responses from you and uh, Romain will reflect on these answers 
when we open the floor for Q&A. So we have a second question for you. So maybe we can go to the second question now. Now that you're well versed on answering quickly, let's go to the second one. All right. So how do you mitigate the risk of digital services increase uh, of digital services increasing equalities between people who are at ease with technology and those with low digital literacy. So very important access uh, question. I can see that people are, have started voting. You have a minute and a half to reflect on the answers. Okay, uh, we got your votes. Uh, Romain, I will give you the floor to reflect on yeah. some of those answers and what you make out of uh, the vote that we got. Uh, mm -hmm. Colleagues who are on the call, uh, note that the results will be shared in the chat, but also the same link that you're using now to answer the questions, you can click on it and you'll be able to field questions um, to our dear Romain. And we'll have a, a we'll we'll check them out. Romain and I can have a look at the, the the your questions. So click on the link while Romain uh, reflects on the results. And actually, the results are also in the chat, so you can um, have a look at the also the results of the of the of the survey in our chat. Mm -hmm. So with that. Uh, Romain, over to you for a few minutes. And also we will open the floor for a minute and then we'll open the floor for questions. Over. Yes, thanks, Ovi. Uh, can, can you get back to the first question? It's easier if I see it. If I see it Absolutely. on the screen, it will be possible. To... Let's, let's do that. Let's go to the first question. With the result of... Okay, that's great. No, that's really, uh, that's really interesting exercise. So we saw, uh, we saw clusters of you know votes around protection of personal and sensitive data and making the tool inclusive by development and design and this is quite an interesting one because when we started to develop red safe some of my colleagues told me but people should register because we'll be facilitate you know uh, when they when they get red safe once you register you create an account from the start you don't have to create later on but we decided not to do so because if we asking the people to register first, they would give quite a lot of personal information that we maybe we don't need to have, I mean, in order to provide the services. And, and registering itself is a complicated act. It's not so simple because you have to create an account. You, need, you might need to have a two-factor authentication and so on. So we decided that to access information as a to access the map of services and to access to alerts you don't need to register you just get you know uh, you download red safe you get access without providing any information i mean to icrc or to anybody else now the second stage was a bit the tension also between the protection of personal and sensitive data and the inclusion because of course if you need to protect your documents and your contacts that are saved in the vault, you need to register, you need to create an account and you need a two-factor authentication. And having, creating a two-factor authentication an account is a complicated, is complicated for most of the people. So uh, the way we, we try to mitigate that uh, risk and work the right balance between these two elements was really providing, setting up kiosk for people who would get uh, assistance, they will get connectivity for free. We have four kiosks in Zimbabwe as we will be helped by volunteers in order to create an account to them. I think it's also something important to say that digital services should not replace all services you're going to, to, to bring to people. So you still need always to have people being face to face, you know, and asking questions, and that all the services you're delivering are not digital because you know that for some people it will not be possible. They will not have the right equipment, and they will not be, uh, you know, providing with connectivity. I mean, to get access to these services. Another um, problem that we have is that when you create, and I'm going to be very specific. When you need to create, uh, for example, an account as a second factor of the authentication, most of the website ask for an email because you can recover your account through an email. 
But if we are looking at inclusions, we find out by interviewing a lot of people, a lot of people don't have email simply, they don't. So if you second factor authentication, you impose an email, you will exclude a lot of people. So we decided to let them the choice between the telephone numbers in order to get an SMS as a second factor of authentication or getting an email. And that's a way, I mean, I mean you base your uh, decisions on interviews, on trying to be inclusive, but at the same time trying to find the right balance between the need to protect the data for which you need, for example, two-factor authentication to create an account. And at the same time, for the fact, second factor of authentication to take into account what people really use and having these interviews and having this feedback from the field. Thank you, Romain. Can you reflect for 20 seconds on the second question? Uh, we have some questions that arise, so I'm going to pick one and ask yeah. them to you. Uh, and then we need to really move to the our next presenter. Yeah, sure. So go ahead, Romain. So um, this is quite similar, I mean, to the first reflection I have. I think it was very important from day one, not only to, I would say, to promote a digital tool based on interview, but really to provide a face-to-face -face support to the people. So for example, in Zimbabwe, we decided to have, again, kiosk manned by volunteers of Zimbabwean Red Crescent in order to, you know, to, to assist people. Uh, were not at ease with technology. They could help them to scan the document and to import it into, into RedSafe as a whole. So basically, this is the way you need to go if you want, I mean, to, to provide also not only technology for the savvy ones, but also the, with the one with low digital literacy. And, um, and not to believe that everybody is able, I mean, to use this technology because you are really surprised by, uh, by the elements and the finding that we had. Thank you, Romain. And I'm taking one question from the floor. Uh, we only have six questions. So six of you actually inputted the questions. I expect in, in the next round, we get more uh, to ask those questions online. Uh, we got one question uh, saying, how did uh, ICRC develop these tools considering levels of literacy uh, and or people with disabilities? A quick answer, and then we go to our next presenter. Over yeah. to you, Romain. Before we decided to develop, because we wanted to avoid having a top-down decision, you know, we, this is what we think the people need and we're going to develop that. So it took a year of interviews, you know, of uh, meeting communities of different variety of communities. We went to, we went to Colombia, we went to Kenya, we went to a lot of different places before, you know, deciding. This is, we think, I mean, the way, um, uh, and we were a bit co-designing, I mean, certain functionality with the people. So we didn't have an app at that time, but we were asking people, how do you, what kind of uh, terms would they use, for example, to even, I mean, simple term like download it. Does it make sense for people? Digital vault, does people understand what it means? Trying to find the simple terms that people understand it based on this field interview. So it takes a lot of time before, you decide to develop it and then you test it and then you see how people react to it and then you have to improve it. So, uh, so you, you not do um, the right thing uh, at the first decision. You need iterations going back and back and improve things. Thank you, Romain. Uh, User-centric being essential to our work, putting our the people we serve at the center of our work is important. Thank you for your time today, Romain. I will book you for a herbal tea when time permits. A lot to discuss. And with that, we go to our next presenter, our colleague Jane from IRC. Over to you. You have 10 minutes. Speak slowly. And then we will have 10 minutes for uh, other sets of questions and Q&A. Over to you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Romain um, and Hovik for that. Um, my name is Jane Mogheny. I am the Senior Technical Advisor, uh, Protection and Rule of Law at the International Rescue Committee, IRC. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, social media protection risk analysis, uh, which is something we have worked on uh, on the back of the work that we did um, on protection uh, analysis, that the protection analytical framework um, in conjunction with the DRC uh, and the Global Protection Cluster. 
Um, could you move to the next slide? So why does it matter to do a social media uh, protection risk analysis? And before we get to the why does it matter, what, what is it? What is the social media? In terms of humanitarian work, um, we are using it a lot at the moment. Um, so we have like social networking um, forums like Facebook and Twitter. We have content uh, hosting sites like YouTube. Uh, we have Reddit, instant messaging, WhatsApp. And more and more in humanitarian settings, we are finding uh, we as humanitarians are using uh, social media a lot, but also uh, our clients uh, and affected populations are actually relying on social media uh, as a means of, you know, to find their loved ones, to mark themselves safe, as, as, as was highlighted in, you know, in the, in the, by the previous pre presenter. And more and more we are finding the growth of users in social media is increasing at a rate of 1 million users per day. So it's not an area that we can ignore and just say, you know, that social media, you know, it's fluffy. We cannot work with that. Um, people are relying on it. It's a source of news. It's a, a way of keeping people safe. There are benefits of using social media. For example, you can deliver a bigger program faster, you know, with one text on WhatsApp, you can reach, you know, several thousands of people. Um, you can get to people who you could traditionally not have been able to reach if they are, you know, in far off cutoff areas, you can get to them. But it does also have its challenges. Social media can fuel conflict. It can lead to human rights violations. For example, we have seen in certain countries surveillance of, 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 of social media um, uh, platforms. Uh, and people, for example, being denied visa or entry just based on something they put on their social media, their Twitter account or their Facebook account. But also in terms of humanitarian work, it can create new barriers for, for especially women and girls, um, persons with disabilities. How do you ensure inclusion? Or it can actually create more barriers or exacerbate barriers that are already existing uh, in, in the humanitarian work that we do. In Myanmar, for example, the Human Rights Commission found Facebook played a critical role uh, in the Rohingya crisis. And we are seeing it uh, as well in even developed countries with Brexit and the US elections. So as I said at the beginning, social media is big and it, it's playing a big role in how risks and online and offline violence plays out in reality. Um, next slide. So what is social media path? So I'll go back and talk a little bit about the uh, protection analytical framework, uh, which I said was developed jointly by IRC and DRC uh, in collaboration with the Global Protection Cluster. It has been endorsed as an approach to protection analysis um, and the resources can be found under PIM and on the GPC website. Um, on the path specifically, uh, looking at the structure of the path, um, when you're doing your analysis, you're kind of looking at you know, your context, you're looking at the threats on the population, how are those threats affecting the population and what are the capacities? So what the path actually does, it just allows you to be able to get information that you need to undertake an analysis. And then it allows you to think through how you're going to organize your data in order to support an integrated um, and independent analysis of the issues. So, it's, it's an analysis in itself is, is just an action. It's supposed to enable you to move towards a response. So you get your information, you organize it, and then you are able to then design an intervention based on what your analysis is telling you. Next slide. So for social media, similar to what you have with the path, with the context, having you know threats, how they affect the population. So let's go, for example, with one of the threats you experience with social media is um, online information and disinformation, right? So you will identify the threat under the yellow tab. How is this threat affecting the population? Let's go with uh, an issue of um, vaccines. Uh, you find a lot of information, uh, misinformation online about vaccine. How are people responding to that? How is that in reality playing out? Does that mean, for example, people don't show up when you know, health teams come out to do vaccines? In that context, is it historically a challenge that people, there's poor uptake of vaccines? So in terms of that, you'll be going through your vaccine program, but using social media to understand how your program is playing out online 
and how that affects uptake of humanitarian services offline. Next slide. So talking about context, to just go a little bit deeper in terms of the analysis itself, what do you need to do? What information do you need to understand a context in terms of humanity, uh, in terms of uh, social media? So when you're looking at social media, you will look at the online information, but you also need to look at the offline information. So historically, what has that context look like? Had looked like. So going by the Myanmar example, historically we knew there had been a conflict um, between the Rohingya and the government. And so that was the, the basis, the grounding of that has conflict and hazard history. What was the political and economic landscape? How are people you know, accessing their services? At, do they exist? What is the institutional and legal framework? So in some countries, for example, you will find uh, maybe social media is banned, it's regulated, it's restricted. Then you look at the media and information landscape. Is, do people trust the media, for example? If people don't trust the media, they're probably, it probably means they are relying on social media as a source of information. So you will need to take that into consideration in your analysis. What is the technology landscape? Is it easily available? Are people connected? Who, who is connected? What is the geographical areas that are connected? So as you're looking at this, you will ask yourself these questions and arrange them in order to be able to understand within this context, what are the social media issues? Next slide. Two minutes, two minutes. Okay, <laughs> I'll try and speed up. So you will then look at the threats, the digital threats. And as I said, a lot of time, what you see online will play offline. And that's why you need to look at both the information you're seeing online and how it's actually playing out online, offline. So sometimes online, you can just see maybe it's trolls and harassment, but what's actually happening offline is people are being arrested, detained, imprisoned. So you will, you will have to look at the digital threats online but mirror them to what is actually happening offline. Next slide. Next slide. How are these threats affecting the population? So for example, um, how are people in, in the US, for example, one of the research that was filed, I think it's the next, uh, the previous slide, sorry. The digital threats that they, that's, the, that's right. One of the things that was found following the, the previous US election was that the dig digital threats were actually very gendered. They were very targeted at women. And the consequence of it was that it actually resulted in vote, low voter turnout, especially of women. So when you look online and look at threats, it's important to then disaggregate who are these threats targeted at? Are they very gendered? Is it a certain age bracket that's targeted at? And then you will look at how that actually plays out. So for example, in this case, it results in low voter turnout. How are people coping with these strategies? Is there someone countering those false narratives that are happening online in the offline world? Next slide. The capacity. What is the capacity of the population? Are people digitally uh, literate? Um, do they understand uh, uh, data security? Do they understand that you can be surveilled? Do they understand the online risks? Is there a capacity of the government, for example, to counter those narratives and stop those things that are happening uh, or, or in, the, in, the, uh, in the online world? And then um, following this, once you've arranged your information in that sense, can you go to the next slide? Test in one then, minute. Yeah, just let, this is just a final slide on how to use it. How then do you use that information? You then, you have four pathways to kind of use, use that information. You can design a program. So for example, if you, in, your own, in your world, um, it's maybe refugees and host communities who are, who are in conflict. You can use that information to then design a peace building program, for example. Uh, you can use it to develop um, evidence-based advocacy. So in this case, for example, you can go back to Facebook and say, hey, Facebook, what you're putting online, you need to maybe take down this type of information. You need to put better security features and you can use that to, to make advocacy. Um, you can use it for protection sensitive programming. So for example, you can look at how it's affecting participation of women, uh, other groups. How can you ensure inclusion? How can you ensure safety? How can you make sure, pro make sure your program if you're using social media is more safe? And then you can use the analysis to also develop um, social media protection strategy. Um, 
the resources are available. I think go to the next slide. Um, we have the resources available, as I said, on the PIM website, uh, PIM website as well as on the GPC. Uh, the social media protection analytical framework is currently in draft. And if you would like more information, I'm happy to share that. But yeah, I would now uh, pause there and open for any questions. Thank you. Jane, thank you very much. You have shared with us uh, a few questions. Now that the crowd is well-versed in answering the questions online, let's go to the first question. And this time you will really have 45 seconds to answer and then we will go to the second. Jane, please take note of the answers as we end, because I'll ask you to reflect on the answers that we've got. Um, when should I consider doing a social media protection analysis? You have two options. If you can think of any others, uh, please use the link eventually to, to put them in um, the Q&A. Um, you have 45 seconds to answer this question. O all right, let's go to, as people have voted, let's close this vote. We got a nuanced answer already from the crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll ask Jane to reflect on what that means for her. Next, go to, let's go to the next one. What types, what types of program interventions can be designed following a social uh, media protection analysis? Now you have three options. All right, we still have a split vote across the three options. This is more for Jane to reflect on. Fantastic. Presents Jane with a dilemma that she needs to answer to. Um, all right, I think people are voting, it's great. Uh, we're gonna go to the next question. I think we have a third question, if I'm not mistaken, for Jane. All right. So, very simple. Can you give one example of a digital threat and how you mitigate this? All right, Jane, we have, you have noted the balanced answers we've got across the crowd. Uh, my colleagues will share now the, the link for you to ask questions and make comments in the link, which I am looking at, so I'm expecting some questions from you as Jane reflects on the answers that we got from the audience, which were quite, uh, you know, uh, balanced. So Jane, over to you for a minute and a half of reflections on the, the answers that you got. Thank you. Um, so when should you consider to do a, uh, an, a social media protection analysis? Really, the answer to this is kind of if you're just going to use social media at any point for anything, you should consider doing a, a social media a protection risk analysis. That is because, you know, as humanitarians, uh, we're now beginning to understand there can be serious risks and threats that, uh, the, that affected populations face as a result of social media. So it is important. I think um, uh, the previous speaker spoke about conducting data impact assessments. It is important that when you're using any kind of technology that you're able to really assess what risks uh, that technology can present and, and try and mitigate that risk uh, before using that technology. Uh, what types of program interventions can be designed? I think really uh, it, it can be any type of program depending on what your analysis tells you. It, it really comes down to your analysis. So if your analysis tells you, you need to do a peace building program, there's an opportunity to do that, then you can do that. If your analysis is telling you there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation, which can then be addressed by, for example, countering those false narratives, you can run a program that counters false narratives. So it really will come down to what your analysis tells you and that's what you will use to design your intervention based on your online context and your offline context. I, I keep emphasizing that just because you have to really understand that sometimes the two don't talk to each other and it's important to really try and merge in order to design um, an impactful intervention. Uh, in terms of digital threats, yes, online disinformation is an example uh, of a digital threat, misinformation. Uh, misinformation is the second one there, which is basically a statement that is known to be, it's, it's, a, it's been defined. It's a statement, misinformation is a statement that's known to be false, that is then 
you know, propagated online. So we have a lot uh, of threats, um, digital threats. So it can be online surveillance, rumors, trolling, hacking. There is, it, it can manifest in several ways. Uh, so this is just an, an example of you know, how, how digital threats play out online. Thank you. Cool, Jane, we actually have uh, one question so far um, and that was asked. Uh, so maybe we can showcase that question on the screen. Um, so that was just one question so far. Um, yeah, these are, no, these are the previous ones. Let's go. And then the last one, yeah. Yes. Jane, do you want to address this question? Is there a set of questions to identify digital risks? Yes, there is a set of questions. So within uh, the path that we have developed, the social media path, we do have a list of questions. So when you go to context, it will, it will tell you, okay, these are the things you need to look at in a context. And then within that, it will give you an example of questions that you need to ask in order to, to elicit an, a response for that. So when you the same when you go to threats, when you go to uh, context, uh, the threats, how communities are, are, are responding, uh, we will give you suggestions as well as a list of questions on how to um, try and get a response in the context that you're working. And yes, it can be made available. As I mentioned, we're still in draft, um, but uh, we're happy for people to use this and. Uh, give us feedback um, in order for us to, you know, tailor it, fine tune and uh, make it accessible and usable. Jen, Jane, I want to thank you for your time with us. We are running a bit late, so I will have to thank you on behalf of everyone. And we go to our next group of friends from Ukraine who are going to uh, be the next presenters. So over to you. Hello, dear colleagues. My name is Alexandra Makovska. I'm representing the Protection Cluster team in Ukraine here at this session. And I am joined by uh, Daria from the NGO Right to Protection and uh, Oleg from the NGO um, Rokada. Uh, we will be sharing uh, and presenting um, the experience of working with a mobile application, DIA, uh, which, is, which was created by the government of Ukraine to facilitate interaction between individuals um, and state institutions when it comes to uh, access to documentation, access to various administrative services, um, as well as uh, the system of provision of uh, social benefits. Uh, a bit of the background, why the government um, took the decision to create this um, tool. Uh, there are two factors. First is the overall uh, agenda uh, of the authorities to simplify access to different bureaucratic procedures and to make uh, lives of citizens easier. The second aspect was the wave of uh, first wave of displacement in 2014 and 15, which made it very obvious for both authorities, civil society, and humanitarian actors um, how much people are dependent on paper documents, um, access to paper archives in different in their areas of origin, and that restoring lost um, documentation is. Uh, a big challenge. Um, this was one of the lessons learned of the first wave of displacement, why there was a decision to develop uh, mobile uh, services for the population. Uh, the application itself was created in 2019. And as of now, there are over 18 million Ukrainians already using uh, this application and the portal where they can uh, upload various, where they can have access to um, their personal documentation, 
as well as uh, different access different types of documents and uh, services. Uh, this is a huge uh, number. Uh, it's about a third of the overall uh, population. Uh, there is the expectation that uh, in, in two years, by 2024, um, about 100% of state public services that relate to documentation and different administrative services will be provided uh, via DIA application. Uh, Currently, this state-run services portal uh, provides about 72 different um, services, uh, offers 16 digital documents uh, that are available uh, to the population. And it's important to note that Ukraine has become the first country in the world to legally recognize the electronic version of the passport at the same level as the paper version of the passport. Um, why this is important to us as protection actors and as humanitarian actors. In the situation of displacement of armed conflict, uh, where large number of population ends up living either in besieged areas or in areas affected by the conflict. Uh, protection partners are facilitating access to, to documentation and are facilitating access to those uh, social benefits that the state can still provide. So when this new tool is being introduced by the national authorities, we by default need to be aware of it, need to monitor uh, to which extent um, conflict affected population can use and access these services to facilitate awareness amongst them um, and to highlight the challenges, particular challenges that are linked to displacement uh, to be able to advocate with authorities that these challenges are taken into account and addressed um, to make the use um, of the tool truly accessible to the whole uh, population, including those most vulnerable who face particular challenges in accessing the, the application. Uh, today, uh, colleagues from uh, Right to Protection and from Rokada will share their particular experience of uh, providing uh, legal uh, services and social services, as well as highlight some pros and cons of the uh, of this uh, digital tool. Over to you, Daria. Thank you, uh, Alexandra. Dear colleagues, partners, my name is Daria Lysenko. As noted earlier, I am a project manager and lawyer at the Charitable Foundation Right to Protection, UNCR implementing partner in Ukraine. For the eighth year in a row, our foundation has supported internally displaced persons, as well as other conflict affect population, providing monitoring, advocacy, legal assistance, and other social services. Both before and after February 22, 20, for sorry, the R2P experts are actively using the DA application to provide legal assistance to beneficiaries. They also teach clients in person using the chatbot legal advisor for ADP and on digital literacy session, how to use app correctly for various government services. Now the most popular services in term of legal assistance in Ukraine are electronic documents such as e-document, digital passports, including foreign, driver license, COVID certificate, IDP certificate. E-document in DIA, for example, make it possible to confirm the identity even in case where all the documents have been lost. Note, as my colleague said before, Ukraine become one of the first countries to recognize digital passports on a pair with paper originals. At the same time, the right to protection in partnership with other human rights organizations has achieved the recognition of Ukrainian digital passport in DIA app in the part of the European Union countries. 
it helps our beneficiaries to cross in particular the Polish border faster. Now, foreign passports, driver license, and vehicle registration certificates in DIA are available in English. As a result of such joint efforts of decision makers and civil society Ukrainians who were forced to flee because of a full scale Russian invasion, are uh, unable to access documents and services and exercise their rights abroad unimpededly. The right to protection, legal experts also actively help IDPs to use the comprehensive service of IDP registration and receiving financial assistance. You can register as IDP and get a certificate in any convenient place just with internet access. Our work is also underway to document the destruction of housing and obtain the status of unemployed clients with the help of DIA. This is one important service that should help create a register of destroyed housing and further ensure that victims receive compensation. Finally, providing legal assistance, we actually use it and teach how to use the email article service on the DIA portal. Such a digital tool help parents and mm, with uh, newborn children, including those from the temporary occupied territories of Ukraine to remotely apply for a birth certificate, registration of their place of residence, Ukrainian citizenship, state uh, assistance at birth, tax number, etc. Of course, work in this direction reduces the risks of the statelessness and improves the access of beneficiaries to public services in general. Nevertheless, our activities continue. Thank you for your time. And I will be glad to answer your question after presentation of my colleagues, Oleg Pastorchak. Oleg, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. Thank you, Alexandra. <clears throat> hope you can hear me. Uh, dear partners, dear colleagues, good afternoon to, to, to all of you. My name is Oleg Pastuszczak. I am the protection coordinator of Rokada Charitable Foundation uh, in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, our foundation is a uh, executive partner of UNHCR for almost 20 years. We used to work with the asylum seekers and refugees until February this year. And now we have a huge, really huge project uh, with the internally displaced persons and the affected population here in, uh, in the Ukraine. As well as our partners from Ukraine, um, Rokada actively used the uh, application to identify persons and to for, for, for registration to various types of state aid. I want to tell you about the most useful uh, DIA uh, functions with our, which our beneficiaries use in their everyday lives. Of course, in addition to the basic documents and basic functions which were mentioned by my colleagues before. Um, first of all, it's um, unemployment benefits. So uh, Ukrainians can get uh, unemployment status and register for uh, benefits just just in one minute, just with your phone in in your hand. The same situation is with the pension ID. Um, in here, you can submit a request for an old age pension and all other types of pensions just with the with the with the phone in your hand. It is very comfortable for for us because. Um, you can you can submit uh, all types of states assistance, uh, including even the application like uh, for uh, subsidies for utilities at winter time. So you can do it without even leaving leaving your home, just sitting in your couch in your chair in your chair. Um, based on our work experience, I would like to share with you also the main advantages and disadvantages of, of, of the application. Uh, let's start with the, with the advantages, as I see. 
so they reduce the burden on the state social protection service. It is a huge problem for, for my country, for Ukraine, at this uh, dark times to to get a full state service. And DIA uh, really helps to, to, to solve this problem because uh, you can do it online. You don't need to go to, to some offices, to other buildings, you can stay at home. Uh, secondly, um, reducing the human burden, including the risk associated with travel. As I mentioned before, uh, Ukrainians can get, a, as I, as me and my colleagues uh, mentioned before, Ukrainians can get thousands of uh, services without leaving their home. It is important because on days when leaving your home, your home is uh, can be danger for your life uh, or for your health. It is it is good when you can stay at home, stay safe, and do do your do your business online. Uh, the next point is um, computer or uh, phone literacy. On one hand, it is a plus because uh, like it's it is an advantage because people are learning some new skills, some new software. But on the other hand, it's uh, like to fully use to fully use the app, you have to know some you have to have some previous skills. So you can't just give the phone to the to little baby and she can't get uh, get she can't do anything because she has no skills. So you have to know something before you use the, the, the application. And we together with our partners, of course, we are working to about the literacy, computer literacy with our beneficiaries. What about the disadvantages? Uh, first of all, of course, you have to got a smartphone. It can be laptop or a computer, but at least you have to have a smartphone to, to use uh, and to got all the documents. The second problem is, and the biggest problem as for me, it's the internet connection. Without internet, you can do anything. And it is a big problem for the parts of my country and some cities where infrastructure was damaged. Uh, there is some, there are some problems with the light, with elect electricity or internet connection, and it is a huge problem because no internet, you can't use the. And of course, as always, mm, we should always care about the about the data protection considerations. Of course, we know that DIA is protected by state, uh, but we should always be aware of the, of the hacker attack. That is all from my point. Thank you for your time and thank you for, for, for listening. Thank you. Awesome. You folks were on time. You were three and you were on time. Perfect. We also have, uh, we have been running against time, even though we tried. So we, you have posed to the crowd one question. So we're gonna, people are gonna vote on that question. So let's have the question on the screen. People will have 45 seconds to, to vote on it. Uh, and then uh, we'll see uh, your reflections on uh, the answers quickly before we go to our lovely colleague uh, from the US government to end uh, the session. So. The question is, how do partners respond to mitigate risks and shortcomings of electronic service provision and facilitate access to services? Super interesting question. Ukraine is cutting edge with your programming on this front. Colleagues, we want you to help us answer this question. You have 45 seconds. Our crowd is providing quite a balanced set of answers to all our questions. It shows the complexity of the situation when it comes to the digital access opportunities and risks. Um, all right, let's go to our three panelists. What are your reflections on this, um, you know, um, I can see legal aid didn't get that much votes, but the rest seem to be getting um, quite a balanced response. Um, any reflections from our guests before we hand over to 
Catherine? Maybe, maybe to start, um, digital literacy training comes as came out as a very big uh, solution uh, and a step for for the future, and it it is it definitely is both on individual level something that both Rokada and Right to Protection are doing now, training people one by one how to make use of services, but also at community level. Um, creating hubs in smaller towns, uh, equipping some of them with the internet so that people can use these services um, themselves. And if they don't necessarily have a smartphone, they can access that through computer. And given the size of, of the country and the size of conflict affected population, because there are areas affected in the east and the south, um, in the north, that's a quite formidable task that requires uh, serious uh, partnerships um, and engagement of multiple actors from the state itself and also to humanitarian actors. Uh, monitoring is indeed very essential and that's something that's embedded in the work of protection partners at the moment, watching constantly who is left behind, who cannot access services. And there have been several rounds of reports already um, taken a snapshot by, by DRC earlier this year, before the escalation in January, by Right to Protection this year in summer, already after escalation, highlighting the, the problems. And Right to Protection was able to feed into the development of, of solutions because they were taken their feedback was taken into account during the development of the updated beta version that is being tested now, where IDPs can change their residence um, registration, which is very important in the current context. Um, development of new digital solutions. Um, I would give the floor here to colleagues. Uh, we would struggle with this one precisely because this particular app is managed by the state. And, and so for, for us as humanitarian actors, we can only advise um, of certain shortcomings, we can propose solutions, but, uh, but to develop an alternative to this uh, would, be, would be quite a challenging task, especially if we speak about services that are to be provided by, by the government. Thank you. Uh, for the interest of time, I think colleagues have your contacts. Uh, they will be in touch. Uh, super exciting. It will be interesting also to explore how systems um, are user centric and how the client's feedback on the use of services is taken into consideration as systems evolve and develop. So super cool. Thank you very much. You were on time. Uh, I would love to stay for hours with you, but we don't. We actually have five minutes left. And with that, I want to thank the crowd and give the floor to our dear colleague, Catherine from PRM for her uh, closing uh, remarks. And she will be the one who will bid you also farewell till next time. So Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hovig. And thank you to all of the fantastic speakers today. Um, I just wanted to start by saying the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration fully supports the safe expansion and adoption of new digital tools and technologies to further protection outcomes, while also mitigating many of the potential risks of digital access that were mentioned today. We proudly fund several of the organizations we heard from today, including UNHCR and ICRC, in their work on digital access and protection. And we're really enthusiastic about all of the work presented and shared today by IRC, by Rakaida, the Right to Protection, and the Ukraine Protection Cluster as a whole. So the panelists today, and from feedback from all of you, we saw a number of different ways uh, highlighted where digital technologies can improve protection for conflict affected populations, but we also saw some of the associated risks. So we heard how cell phones and social media can enable families to keep in touch when they're separated. We know that this can make family reunifications easier than ever before. We also know that humanitarian implementers can leverage these technologies to more easily communicate with affected populations, making community participation and two-way feedback faster and more effective. 
It was great to hear from ICRC on their Red Safe Digital Humanitarian platform and hear examples of how humanitarians are using digital technology to safely share information with affected communities. And we know that other organizations are also increasingly using messaging technologies like WhatsApp as feedback and communication channels as well. However, at the same time, we're all very conscious of the need to acknowledge that social media and digital messaging apps can contribute to misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech, and increase, in some cases, protection risks. So it was great to hear today about the work that IRC and ICRC are doing to track and mitigate these threats online and to develop a framework to do so. We haven't talked as much about this today, but we also know that digital technologies can positively affect protection through the shift from paper data collection to password protected digital collection on tablets and mobile devices. We know that this can reduce risks for staff, for humanitarian staff, and reduce the risk of seizure of sensitive beneficiary data um, less likely. Paper records we know are very vulnerable to loss, theft, and misuse. So while it can reduce the risk of misuse, we also know it can introduce new risks related to password or pin sharing, uh, especially if populations are not digitally literate. Digital access can also enable safer storage and issuance of passports and other personal documents as described by our partners of the, our colleagues from the Ukraine Protection Cluster Partners, which leads to improvements in migration and birth registration. It can also facilitate access to government services and safety nets, creating cost savings and bureaucratic efficiencies. But as noted, we have to make sure that governments and humanitarian organizations are mindful of data protection requirements and challenges around cell phone access and digital literacy, especially in marginalized communities. So in closing, together we need to work as a humanitarian community to leverage the advantages of digital access for protection while also working to mitigate these risks. So thank you to our panelists for sharing information on their work today. Thank you to the organizers, and thank you to all of you, all of the participants here today for your active participation and contributions. We hope that everyone participating today can take away some new ideas for how to use digital technologies to improve protection outcomes and mitigate potential risks. With that, we'll go ahead and close the session Please note that the Zoom room will remain open for the next session, so you can remain on the line if desired. Thank you to everyone and have a wonderful rest of the day.